yang berbahagia Prof. Dr. Aziza Nak Musamah, Pengarah Malaysia Antarctic Research Program National Antarctic Research Center UNC Malaya. Yang berbahagia Prof. Dr. Muhammad bin Kasim, Dekan Fakulti Sains dan Teknologi. Yang berbahagia Prof. Datuk Dr. Sharifah Mastura Syed Abdullah, Penyandang Kursi Perubahan Iklim UKM YSD, merangkap Pengarah Institut Perubahan Iklim. Pegawai-pegawai kanan dan agensi kerajaan dan UKM serta hadirin dan hadirat yang dihormati sekalian Prof. Datuk Dr. Azizan Abu Samah dilahirkan pada 22 Ogos 1954 di Jitra Kedah Dia mendapat pendidikan awal di sekolah Sultan Tajuddin Jitra sebelum meneruskan pengajian ke sekolah menengah Tajuddin Beliau kemudian telah ditawarkan untuk menyambung pengajian ke Kolej Melayu Kuala Kangsar iaitu MCKK Setelah tamat persekolahan Prof. Datuk Dr. Azizan melanjutkan pelajaran ke peringkat sarjana muda di Universiti Monash dalam jurusan fizik pada tahun 1977. Pada tahun 1982, beliau menamatkan pengajian peringkat sarjana dari La Trobe University dalam jurusan atmospheric fizik. Cintanya dalam bidang sains tidak membuatkan beliau mudah berputus asa. Malah beliau meneruskan pelajarannya ke peringkat PhD dalam bidang meteorologi dari Reading University, United Kingdom pada tahun 1990. Prof. Datuk Dr. Azizan memulakan karier sebagai pensyarah di Jabatan Geografi Universiti Malaya pada tahun 1983. Beliau kemudian ditawarkan kenaikan pangkat kepada Prof. Madya pada tahun 1992 daripada Jabatan yang sama. Pada tahun 1998, beliau telah terlibat dalam ekspedisi Antartika di stesen penyelidikan Scott Base Manakala pada tahun 1999 Beliau telah mengetuai program SPDC Malaysia yang pertama Di pusat penyelidikan Scott Base tersebut Kemudian beliau telah dilantik menjadi ketua Kepada, kepada Antarctic Boundary Layer Research Project Observatory At Rose Ice Shelf, Antarctica Bermula dari 6 hingga 13 Februari ta tahun 2002 Prof. Datuk Dr. Azizan telah terlibat dalam ekspedisi ke Antarctica Bersama bekas Perdana Menteri Malaysia Tun Dr. Mahdi Mohamad Dengan belayar bersama kapal The Captain Derinistrin Icebreaker Terkini, beliau memegang jawatan sebagai pengarah Malaysia Antarctic Research Program Dan juga pengarah kepada National Antarctic Research Center di Universiti Malaya dengan tidak melengahkan masa, saya berbesar hati untuk menjemput yang berbahagia Prof. Datuk Dr. Azizan Abu Samah untuk naik ke pentas untuk menyampaikan syarahan yang bertajuk The Drivers of Climate Change in the Maritime Continent and the Enabling Role of Big Data and Modeling. Dipersilakan. Uh, pertamanya, saya ingin bawa kepada yang bawah tu. Uh, kerana selain daripada uh, menjadi pengarah kepada NARC saya juga adalah satu senior professor di Jabatan Fakulti di Jabatan Geografi dan masih lagi aktif uh, di dalam bidang geografi di Jabatan Geografi dan juga saya juga adalah uh, timbalan pengarah Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences iaitu satu institut yang bertaraf high COE uh, dia ada tiga High CUE Institute di UM kalau saya tak salah dan IUS adalah antara yang uh, High CUE uh, di UM dan juga berkait dengan ini saya bukan sahaja uh, membuat penyidikan dan masih lagi membuat penyidikan di kawasan Antarctic uh, saya juga membuat penyidikan di, di Malaysia dan khasnya di Laut Cina Selatan So, among the thing that I'm interested in in this lecture is just to give a issue of global warming and then <clears throat> and then uh, we want to talk about the drivers of weather and climate in the maritime continent because I assume I'm talking to a more general public and the connection between Siberia uh, this is the mid-latitude part, uh, 
especially the cool surge and also the connection with the Australian high and the southwest monsoon. And this is the two sub, what you call subtropical high, the high pressure area, which is the source of our air that comes over to both the peninsula uh, and Sabah and Sarawak. And these are the ones that is more likely to be influenced by the rapid warming, both in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. So the, our strategy is to look into how the Australian high and also how the Siberian high is impacted. And then from the Siberian high, how it is, or the Australian high, how it's going to then impact our monsoon. So that is one area of research that we are getting on. And of course, when you talk about uh, the influence of extreme weather, an area that I think people here, uh, Juning and also uh, Fred, is working on is on the MGO. So we also jump into the bandwagon. Not that we do, we are not that believing on the MGO, but since the international community, especially Japan, and also people in UEA are going to MGO, we are also do looking at it from a different perspective. And then the other one, of course, for our region is the influence of ENSO and La Nina, especially ENSO, because ENSO influence that we work on is not only ENSO influence in the South China Sea, but we have already published about ENSO influence in the Antarctic, because ENSO is such a major, uh, what you call, uh, phenomena that it influences across uh, both the southern hemisphere and also towards the northern hemisphere. So it's a very strong signal. And then in the last bit, I will just skip a bit on, you know, the, what are the predictions for the maritime continent? and what are the constraints uh, that, that we have in terms of trying to predict uh, what's going to happen to our region, which is the maritime continent. Okay, so uh, this is the classic picture of global warming. So what you expect is that temperature carbon dioxide is going to go up, temperature is going to warm up, and this is the scenario, uh, this is the A2, business as usual, A1, B, you have some mitigation, B, you, you have complete mitigation. And this is the phenomenon at 2020 and this at 2019. So everything, what, what you can see is that the most important region of warming is the Arctic. Yeah? And what we will argue with you is that the Arctic warming will have something to do to influence the Siberian Hi, which is over here, and actually what we are speculating is that uh, the weather, northeast monsoon, the CMIP 5 tend to decrease the northeast monsoon, but from observation, what we saw is that the moment you have Arctic warming, you have Siberian cooling. I think that's one work that we publish in. And the responses to the warming, as I said, there are some region that cools down. Europe cools down, and this, I think, has to do with the warming, and has to do with what you call the Arctic Oscillation. And so some are heats up, but some are cool, cooling. So global warming is not warming all the time. In fact, some region with global warming, it starts to cool down, and especially Europe. Yeah, you can see here. Right. So associated with global warming is, of course, the expansion of the seawater. And it's also related to the melting of the land glaciers. And also, of course, melting of the glaciers in the Arctic and also in the Antarctic, and also melting of the permafrost in the Arctic and in the Antarctic. And this has, has all many, many implications, but the one that is more related to us is the sea level rise. And the expected sea level rise at the moment is about 3.2 mm per year, which means by 21st century is about 0.5 meter. 
and you know what are the implications uh, that it will have on our what you call uh, coastline is also another area of research. Right. So there are two basically drivers. The first is the constant one. And the constant one is two, is our topography and our alignment of our islands. The existence of Sumatra is a very important uh, barrier because it separates the uh, what's happening over the South China Sea with what is happening over the Indian Ocean. And, so, and also how the wind is channeled uh, due to the structure of the islands, it also gives rise to the, your Borneo vortex. So orography is a constant, uh, what you call an important component of how the air and also how the weather in our region is being influenced. And then the other one is the variable. Of course, the first one is your summer and winter monsoon, which is every six monthly you have this change of air. And then, of course, you have the MGO, which is about you have rain, dry, rain, dry, as, with a cycle of a month. And then, oops, sorry. And then you have La Nina, which is about two or three years. And then you have the 10-year Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which is a 10-year situation. And why I point this one out is that when you do sea level rise, you need to have at least three or four uh, decades, which means that you need to know maybe 40 years or 30 years for you to take account of the Decadal Oscillation. But if you come, because the, the decadal oscillation controls the wind. The wind controls your sea level. And so when, when you miss the decadal, that means you, you, let's say they are positive and negative. Positive, that means stronger wind. Then you have sea level rise. But uh, when you have negative decadal, you have uh, less wind, the sea level drops. So, so one of the things that I think I was a member of Nahrib, I asked the question, is your data long enough to take account of the decadal? Because it's, you cannot just do a linear projection if you don't take into account the decadal variation. Then the other one, of course, back to Tate, the high latitude, mid latitude interaction, especially the Siberian high, the Arctic oscillation, and of course in the Antarctic is the same. The southern annular mode, which is a wind that goes all around uh, Antarctic that basically uh, keep the Antarctic cool and prevent the warm air from going into the mid-latitude. So there's Arctic Oscillation and there's a sand. And then, of course, as I said, sea level rise. And all this has an effect on this primary productivity. So back to biology, back to the fish because it impact on your primary productivity. Right, this is like the dino. This is local time, eight o'clock in the morning, 11, two o'clock, five o'clock in the morning. So what you can see is that, let's say it starts in the morning, most of this coast is offshore, this is the rain, right? And then once you go to uh, afternoon, I mean, afternoon, yeah, it goes, then starts to go inland, okay? This is what is being reality. Now, there's a model that we use called WARF model, and, and also I've worked with my colleagues from uh, France using Meteor. None of the sea breeze or, or the WARF model really got the sea breeze right. Because what they tend to do is that they just tend to evac the, what you call, evac the convection. So once convection occurs over the sea, as an example, they just evac it. But actually, it's not like that. It's a flip-flop. Comes out here, and then drops here, and then comes up here. And the model cannot take that. 
it cannot model it because your model is mid latitude. It tends to evac. And this is one of the, when I was talking to my colleagues in the Royal Society, one of the issue, fundamental issue that has not been yet solved. And that's why it makes, uh, in terms of dinal and land sea breeze, warp is still bad. It tends to under predict by about four hours before the thing can come in. And so this is one of the challenges. Now, Fadil is in around. This is his PhD thesis. And what he did is that he was studying on the May to 22nd uh, flood. And what he does was he just take out uh, Sumatra. That means he makes Sumatra flat. So this is when Sumatra is flat. And then at one stage, he so this is real. OK, this is what happened. This is how the rainfall happened. And what he does is that, you know, he does the control run, and then he flattens Sumatra. That's nice. You know, you can flatten it. And then the other one, of course, he removes Sumatra all the way, and then Malaysia becomes Sumatra. And what you, you have is that for this one, you have convection. The Sumatras exist because of the Sumatra. It is in a squall line. And this is when you take Sumatra away, then Malaysia is the one that gets the most rain. So this is the influence of orography that Fadil got for his PhD. Right. So the next one is, of course, your northeast monsoon. And of course, the one that drives your northeast monsoon is the high pressure area, the Siberian high over here, and the cropping. And this is the January 2017. And you can see the streamline. You can see the northeast monsoon being developed. And then, of course, the northeast, the, the, what you call the southwest monsoon is the other way around. Your high pressure belt is over in the Australian region, and the air is, goes across the equator, swing as a southwest monsoon. And so this is the June, July, August. And it has an impact on the rainfall, because what you see is that during the winter, that is northeast monsoon, you have surge, the rainfall tend to occur over the southern bit of the hemisphere, about here. And of course, you have, during the summer, you have the rainfall being more over mainland Southeast Asia. So you have this big flip flop that's occurring. Now, as a current engine, when you do current engine, the atmosphere is a big kind of engine for transporting heat, and maybe 50-60% of the heat is being transported by latent heat. That means in the, mid, in the uh, maritime continent, there's this huge swing of heating. In summer, you heat the, the northern bit of the uh, maritime continent, and then in winter, you hit the southern bit of the maritime continent. So between, in terms of the peninsula, I mean, in terms of the maritime continent, between the DGF minus JGA, this is work done by C.P. Chang, what you see is that the strongest circulation is the one during the winter, the northeast monsoon. And you can see why, because here is in terms of wind, yeah? when you DGA minus JGA, what you find is that the strongest one is over here, yeah? where well, you're positive, 10 meter per second. So, so the northeast monsoon, to us, is the more vigorous circulation in comparison to the southwest monsoon. So, so which means that, you know, we, we, if any, uh, and we know that the northeast monsoon is the one that brings the most rain, so it's part of your. So when you want to look at, um, let's say, extreme weather, obviously you will look into the northeast monsoon period because that's the most vigorous in comparison to the southwest monsoon. Okay. Now, Fred is not around. Main thing that. This C.P. Chang's work, we are a bit uh, skeptical about MGO and the cold surge because 
what we found is that C.P. Chang pointed out that when you have NGO, the search is less. This is C.P. Chang's work. Lah. And we, I've, I've been having my quarrel with the Japanese because the northeast monsoon is strong when it comes from the northeast. MGO is strong when you, we have a westerly anomaly, anomaly. So which means that you, you will decrease your search because you are increasing your westerly. And that's what C.P. Chang's work say, is that when you have search intensity is high, MGO activity goes down, right? So, but the Jap you know, it's, it's a very much uh, uh, uphill battle in the sand. So when I was talking to my colleague Prince, Prince was saying, look, Azizan, why don't you produce a review on weather in, in here, so that at least uh, we can you know, put it on a, a review paper. And this one, the challenges that I have not yet taken. We'll do it. Right, so this is the 2014, and, and there is some hint here of some MGO activities, but it's more towards the, uh, what you call, southern bit of the hemisphere, I mean, 10 degrees south, yeah? So you can see rain here, and then no rain here. So there are some link, but our feeling is that it's more associated with the southern hemisphere because what happened with the southern hemisphere, the moment it cross the equator, it swing westward. And then that's where the MGO then will contribute to increase the wind speed. So it's more a southern hemisphere, that means Indonesian signal, that is more influenced by the MGO than the northern bit because the northern bit is still in the easterly. So this is something of the issues that we are, I think we published some work on it uh, in Journal of Climate or something like that. Just recently, you can look at, uh, I think, it's, is that Ui? Ui again, my colleague. Ui uh, is in, uh, just came out, I think, 2017, the paper. Yeah? Oh, 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 okay. Right. Now, this is the work that we have taken quite a while where we look into how the uh, Siberian high influence on Malaysian weather and this is the, uh, the work that we're looking at the Siberian at the vortex now when you have a cold surge the cold surge comes over and about here it splits uh, it splits here so one splits over to the Andaman Sea and then there's another outflow and there's also an area that what I'm calling called the Andaman Low, which is another vortex that will pull more air into this region. And this is some of the issues that we are investigating when we are looking at how extreme weather can happen. Because what we want to know is what extra moisture is being pulled into the peninsula region. And also, it is very important that the rain doesn't occur over here, but the rain occur over here. So this and area of research that we are on, on the process undertaking, right? And, but what I'm trying to show is that once it swings over, so you have one wing coming over this side, and then when it swings, and then it generates the vortex. And so this is where the topography is important, of the Borneo, because when it swings, yeah, so you have easterly coming here, then you have a bit of southwesterly, and then it matches and then it starts to create a vortex. And that's the vortex that order your rainfall. Because in order to, for you to have uh, what you call a lot of rainfall, you must order your convection. And so you need anywhere, even in terms of the cold surge over, over this region here, you still need to create a vortex. Because that will order and sustain your convection. So the, and I think this is a Matsuno, uh, or, talk about it, about the role of the vortex. And so there's something that is uh, uh, important to, also from you all. I, I put one paper with Matsuno long time ago. He sat on it, and then after that, I saw another paper which is very similar to mine. <laughs> so kadang-kadang kena tipu juga kita ni. 
But he did not, you know, you, you, because that's one of the, some of the tricks that uh, editor plays on, on you. Okay, so this is a Borneo Vortex that we studied, and as I said, as it, we, we look at this has been published. And what I want to show is the amount of, uh, this is uh, what you call, um, so I think this, let's see, this is, uh, ah, this is, uh, I'm not sure what is this. Let me, because I think the, some of it are uh, temperature range, I think some of it are uh, velocity range, right? need to go and back and read my paper. Now the more important thing for me that is, is how does the vortex interact with the Hadley circulation? And what you can see is that the moment the vortex occur, you have increase of the Hadley circulation. So this is latitude and you have this transform back to the mid latitude. So so this is what you call the scale interaction, the area that uh, basically I'm pushing my group to, to research on. And even when you did the Ross, Ross uh, what you call uh, the interaction in the Ross severe wind, we also look into scale interaction. Right, uh, okay. So this is what the research showed. I'm not going to read it, I'm just giving you some glance that you can read, especially those who are interested in doing some research. So, so as I said here, via the Hadley circulation, the Borneo vortex will then feed back into the subtropical jet stream, hence completing the cycle. So you can see, in the sense, you have the surge coming in towards the tropic, and then you have the Hadley circulation feeding, that's the convection, feeding in, and you have, this, you have in the upper air, something going back to feed into the jet stream and you, in this sense, you have one complete continuity. So that's uh, one, of the, one of the things that we publish and uh, find in our work. Okay, the other one that we work on is the ENSO cycle, impact on Southeast Asia. So you know ENSO is neutral. So most of the convection is over our region, over the warm pool, and the subsidy is over uh, Latin America and this area, so lots of clouds here, less cloud here, and of course the other one is the uh, Indian oscillation, which we, we are now slowly looking at the Indian dipole. And what you have in La Nina, you have the shift towards the center of the Pacific, and you have subsidence over here, and this is the normal sort of picture that you have. You have more dry region here. Um, and we are interested not only on how ENSO impact our region, but we are also interested how it impact right up to the Arctic. And we, we, we show that it has some influence on the southern annular mode. And this rainfall. Right. The other one that I was working on is the role of deep convection. Because in this region, you have deep convection, and this is the best way, especially for short-lived hydrocarbon, to be put back into the stratosphere. Because short-lived hydrocarbon, can say, can last only two weeks the most, and you need to transport it quickly from where it's produced, and then the moment it goes into the stratosphere, it can last for a long period. And this accounts for 2% of ozone displacing substance. And so this is the Shiva project in which I was involved. And, and this is the main let's say, reason why we set up our Bacho station. Because the first landfall and the first convection occurs at the Bacho station. So we are lucky. And that's where our gauze station is situated. And you can see that from the Bacho station now, and there's some work by Ashford, which uh, was working with us, and basically showing how using name, right, this, uh, that 
quite a lot of pollution are coming out from China, coming to our region during the cold surge. So, so then it breaks one <coughs> image. We tend to think that in Bacho, during the northeast monsoon, is very clean air. Now we know that we are wrong. It brought quite a lot of oxygen. Uh, I mean, quite a lot of uh, what you call air rich in ozone to the uh, to our region, and the source is of course from uh, China. So this is quite interesting transboundary work. So quite fortuitous that we we have our Bacho station. And the one that I think is important is this. So you, you take it from East Asia and then you just put it up in our region. This is the ODS issue, the hello carbon. We can then do it straight into the stratosphere and then it will leave. So it's an important transport mechanism of short-lived hydrocarbon. In fact, there's one work done by Scott Hoskin uh, for his PhD in Cambridge that shows this region is the hot spot where you inject short-lived hydrocarbon into uh, the atmosphere and to go to the stratosphere and account maybe about 2% of ozone depleting from non and this is the work done by uh, Karen Adcock, just published uh, in a ACP, in which basically it shows uh, CFC 13A, which is very rich in China, coming over to our side and then being injected. So they just published 2018. You can have a look at this paper. Right. So the thing is, the monsoon also impact on the ocean, right? And I think this some work done partly by Brad's group, but also by Parship, especially in ROMs, yeah? And so what you can see is that during the winter, you have this circulation and then you have this very important cool tongue that's coming out from Vietnam and then during the summer it reverses because it's driven by uh, wind stress of the ocean so so comparatively the south china sea is different than the sulu sea the sulu sea is very much controlled by the current but the south china sea is very much controlled by the monsoon which means the productivity of the South China Sea is also controlled by the monsoon. And this is the problem. When you want to study that, the data is sparse. You have data with Petronas, but they never give it to you. You have data with PHN, also they never give it to you. So what do we do? Uh, this is where I, I use the IOS hat. We talk to the Chinese, and we are now putting a buoy somewhere right there. And we are now going to do a proper, that means we use models. They have their ROMs model. But models without validation are junk. That's one of the things modelers must always remember. You model, but you don't do any validation, that model is junk. You must always validate your model. And so this is why the, we are putting in a buoy, and the buoy is one million US dollar. Mad Ocean buoy, big buoy. Hopefully it's not stolen. <laughs> during the northeast monsoon and during the summer monsoon. And this, we are going to deploy it, um, I think, in um, um, June for, the, for this uh, season. But MKN put a, put a caveat uh, we can, for, for third party sharing, we need to ask uh, MKN approval. But as I said, my philosophy has always been to share. I'm quite confident that uh, you can publish, any, as long as you don't come and publish and compete with me, it's okay. You know, but you can publish 
on many things without you know competing with each other and still use the same data. So I'm quite uh, open to sharing. And we are sharing this all already with UMT. Right, and this is the circulation. And it is important because when you have the cold pool, especially during northeast monsoon, what you do is you split the convection. When you have this cold pool here, you split the convection one over this side and one over the next side. And that is why in February, yeah, in February, most of the rainfall is over here and also over here. And you don't have the rainfall over Klantan area. And that's because of the warm, a cold tongue that comes out from on the sea surface temperature. So it's quite lean. And the more important thing for primary productivity, so you have this Vietnam art welding where you have increased in chlorophyll concentration. Of course, you have a lot of chlorophyll concentration over the Strait of Malacca. But, but what you can see is that from here, to uh, the end of the northeast monsoon, it changes the productivity. And why are you interested in productivity? Because I am now wearing my TPT director hat. Is because in IOS, uh, we have both air-sea interaction. We also are interested in primary productivity. We are interested in uh, fish population and all that sort of other things. So I, 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 our data and what we research in do contribute to the biology group. So it's more multidisciplinary. Right, and ENSO too has, a, has an influence. This is neutral. This is La Nina. So you can expect the Vietnam upwelling to be stronger because the South Northeast monsoon is stronger. And during ENSO, actually, the primary tropical shift more towards the tip of Borneo. And this is where we would expect you to have what you call uh, harmful algae bloom during uh, and so period. Okay, I think I'm nearly finished. Now the regional driver, this is the work on the Arctic Oscillation, and this is where we start to work on the Siberian High, and to show how the Siberian High uh, becomes stronger during uh, AO uh, negative, right? And become less strong during AO positive. So this is important because the one that drives our, Siberian, our northeast monsoon is the Siberian high. If the Siberian high becomes cold, right, which is with Arctic warming, the Siberian high is going to be colder. And that will mean that the northeast monsoon is going to be stronger, if you use the logic. So you expect more rain during the northeast monsoon with global warming. Right? That's, that's, the, that's the deduction that one would take. But you, know, you need to do more research with some modeling work to confirm that. So this is a sea level rise, this is Narim, I think Narim did some work on it. And this is a very famous uh, risk on sea level rise, I'm not going to talk about it. But what I'm going to talk about is that with sea level rise is okay, because it's uh, like cancer, slowly, you know. The one that is important is the surges, the cold surge, the surges, where, the, where if we combine with high tide, that means nip tight, combined with the surges, this is the one that causes you the problem. And this is the one, as I said earlier, that is going to increase because the northeast monsoon is going to be stronger. Right. And I'll just mention in, in a short one. When you talk about the whole global circulation, 75% of the productivity of this site is funded from Antarctic. So if the Antarctic deep water starts to uh, uh, what you call not strengthen, 75% of the productivity, especially of, the, of our region, is going to be impacted. So you know, don't think that uh, what happened to the Antarctic is not, uh, it's not related to what happened to us because 75% of our productivity is controlled by the Antarctic Thermohyde Line circulation. Right, and the other one that we are also undertaking, and this is dealing with wearing my hat as a punya work, is the extent of how much the Antarctic sea ice 
influence the monsoon. But the first one that we want to look at is the Indian monsoon, because when you look at the whole uh, topography of India, is the one that is really here. You have the whole uh, what you call Asian continent. Here you have the Antarctic. So we we speculate that the Antarctic will have a much stronger influence on India and East Africa, and so there's nothing to stop us to do research on it. So we do research on it. <laughs> the speaking global. And uh, I think this one you must have. Uh, and so we, we did find uh, some correlation, especially here, where the Arctic, when the, you have high sea ice over the Antarctic, it influenced the rainfall over southern India. So now we, we, we are now looking at why, what are the dynamics uh, that will uh, contribute to make less rainfall over the south of India. So you look at Rossby signal, you look at uh, convergence signal, you look at divergence signal, you look at the Hadley circulation, you also look at what happened at the Mascarene High. There's another tropical high over the Indian Ocean. So that's one PhD student working on it already. Uh, and and we, we got um, interest uh, from a number of groups, especially from the Indian, because of, of, of course India is very much interested in their summer monsoon. And the other one that I think we've not really, really start to work on is how much it impact on the Indian dipole and also how much it impact on East Africa. Because East Africa actually is much nearer to the Antarctic and it has a more influence uh, than that. Okay, so I, will, I skip this a bit. And this is where our prediction may be different because they are saying that the, there's a decrease in the what we call Northeast Monsoon Index. We are saying it, it might not be the other way, it might be this way. So this is something that CIMIP is saying, is something that observation we are saying different thing. So, you know, there's something debatable that we need to show and, you know, why not think differently because, you know, you don't have to follow the bandwagon. And the other one that I, I don't follow the bandwagon, people here are so much concerned about ENSO, but actually ENSO is not a problem to us. It's only a problem to Hayes because, you know, drying, because we are tropical wet, you know, you, you have less rainfall, 10%, 20%. What is problem to us is when it's neutral and when you have La Nina, that is when you have your big plants. So for us, we need to study more on La Nina and neutral than to study ENSO. While actually, you know, ENSO may be important to Mexico, but its impact to us is less. It's neutral and La Nina that has greater impact. That's when our floods occur. So we need to know more about those than about the other one. I mean, you can still study on I mean, There's nothing to stop you. So, as I said, no one is going to do your own study. When I, I met my African nation, my African friends, all of them say, you know, let uh, UK does for, you know, Nigeria. So I said, nobody is going to do for it. UK will first look into UK. In this lecture, I said I will talk a bit about big data. The only thing that I will say is that big data is now free. CMIP 5, which is the whole global, is free. CMIP 6 is coming out, is free. The ERA interim, which is among the best data set on metrology from 1950 to now, you can download it. So in our center, we download the whole lot already of ERA interim globally. Right? And then once you have those data, it's your skill as a meteorologist or your skill as whatever to look into the data, to look for whatever that you want to look at. As I said, you can see for me, there's nothing to constrain me if I want to look at India. Why not? So why should I just look into Malaysia? Why, why can't I also look into East Africa? Why not? Because the data is now available to you. And of course, working in the Antarctic, I mean, 
I'm looking at the whole globe. I'm not just interested in what is happening in Malaysia only. And with all this available, and especially for Malaysia, when you have this contribution from the irrigation department, I think it will increase the qual quality and quantity of work coming out. And I need to review my book, Malaysia uh, Weather and Climate, because I think the amount of new information, the amount of new work has already increased. And we published it in 2004. I think the only book on Malaysia Weather and Climate. So I'm going to uh, update that, inshallah. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.